Thanks everybody for tuning in. I'm Chris Torrance. The uh, as, as Todd told me, apparently I'm the chief strategy officer. I don't know. Is that your title? I'm, I'm, I'm aspiring to get that way, and I guess we'll just go with it for now. Okay. Um, so, Todd, uh, welcome. I know you flew in today from Richmond. Richmond, Virginia. Yeah. that's uh, It might happen to be the Commonwealth of Virginia. happens to be my home state, so we already well, have go. something in common, although I know you're a and we got of rid Ohio. Of you. Yeah, you did years ago. Yes. So I still get back for a visit every so often. <laughs> so, Todd, uh, why don't you introduce yourself for those that may not know? I mean, we know you're the CIO, so you are, uh, you're the big man. But why don't you give us a little more context of uh, what your CIO role entails over at Estes Express? Oh, so at Estes, um, I'm the CIO at Estes Express Lines. A um, lot of the jokes I make, like in our industry, we've we've gotten title happy, right? So there's CIOs, CTOs, CTIOs, CISOs, Chief people Data are, Officers, yeah. like <laughs> whatever you want it to be. We have a CIO. <laughs> um, so really, at the end of the day, I have a I have accountability for. Um, kind of all of the IT operations and a lot of what we're doing to kind of drive the business forward from a technology perspective at Estes. Um, for context, and I know I know you have a lot of this and you know all of this, um, we are the largest privately held trucking company yeah. in the United States. Um, we are, I'll say, one of the largest in these days that where we fit changes, sure. um, given with the, the changes in the market, but we're one of the largest LTL providers in the country. Yeah. Um, so we move lots of freight. Yeah, um, that's one way to put it. In a little bit of the industry that lots of people outside of the industry don't know exists or don't understand. Yeah. Well, on that note, how, how, Todd, how did you get into this lovely trucking <laughs> LTL space? And who I, I assume some people might, you know, use acronyms quite a bit. So yeah. even LTL. So tell us first, how, okay. how, how did, how did, uh, how did I end Estes up here? family somehow convince you or bamboozle you into joining uh, the family over at Estes? No, fair enough. Um, so I had spent a we'll call it 20 years in consulting, um, a large portion of that in Richmond, Virginia. So, uh, and Richmond's a really big small town. Yeah. So lots of community in the IT space there. Um, I had done work with the prior CIO at Estes right. um, and had been talking to him about kind of the next steps in my career, right? Yeah. Like when you hear consultant, it's lots of road warrior, um, those sorts of things. And I wanted to be home a little bit more. And quite frankly, in the consulting space, you get to go half solve lots of problems. Well said. Right, like <laughs> you can put a plan together, you can tell people how to solve it, um, and you can say, oh, this is gonna take you six months. Yeah. And then you leave. Yeah, how do I implement that? Right, yeah. so I, <laughs> I really missed kind of the implementation side, and I'd been talking to some of, my, some of my customers, some of my peers in the marketplace, and Bob, when he was leaving Estes, happened to call me and say, you know, you should talk to Webb. Yeah. And you know, a short six months later, um, through lots of rounds of conversations and interviews, uh, I ended up uh, getting chosen really on, Webb and I had had a very early conversation of, if you want to keep doing what you've always done, I'm probably not the person to hire, because um, the status quo gets uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, and really, not only was Estes, but the industry was kind of at an inflection point of kind of coming out of the, the sleepy old trucking industry of like, we're using lots of paper to do X, Y, and Z and customers aren't very integrated and running the business on yesterday's reports yeah. or, or even customers were fine with, I know it's going to be there. Um, and it all kind of start to, sure. started to shift. Lots of integration, lots of demand for in the kind of B2B space mm -hmm. to match that user experience people were getting in the consumer space. Um, so that started to drive lots of digital transformation. It, made, it makes for a very interesting job, lots of challenges, um, and an ability to learn a whole new industry. Yeah, and speaking of industry, yeah. so again, we have, I think a lot of people have this idea of what logistics or supply mm -hmm. chain, the umbrella, and I always try to break it down right into segments and subsets, right? Mm -hmm. So we have supply chain as the broad ecosystem. Within that, we have logistics. Mm -hmm. Logistics, we have trucking. Trucking, we have full truckload. We have partial mm -hmm. and LTL. Correct. So for those that may be tuning in, they go, <laughs> what is, they keep saying LTL. LTL. And I know LTL. we can say it stands for less than truckload. No, no, no kidding, right? What, what does that mean? Right, so tell us kind of, give us a glimpse into how, when you think about LTL relative to the broader space, how do you kind of define LTL when you're yeah. kind of engaging with people that may not, Thanksgiving dinner, right. what is LTL? Like, and I, I've done all kinds of things. Like I've done software analogies, like, but- I'll, I'm an analogies guy. I'll, so try to keep, I'll try to keep it simple. <laughs> so really at the end of the day, and these sound like big words, we aggregate and disaggregate freight, 
Okay. Right? Like, so if you think about it, like a city like Richmond or Dallas, right? Like there's lots of suppliers or producers here in the Dallas area, which yeah. is where we happen to be. Yeah. Um, oftentimes they need to get something across the country or across town or across the state but they don't have 53 feet of product, which is the size of a full semi-trailer. That's right. Um, For so, those of you, the trucks going down the road that you typically see. Yeah, they're about that's, 53 that's, feet. That's the full truckload we're referring to. Yeah, that's typically. the full truckload, right? Yeah. That's the like, I've got yeah. 53 feet. Uh, 102 wide. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like all the dimensions that are escaping yeah, me yeah. at the moment. And I fill that truck up and I send it from point A to point B. Same driver, same truck. It gets locked on one end, unlocked on the other. Lots of folks are moving much smaller shipments these days, largely because of e-commerce, right? Mm -hmm. Like you, you don't buy a whole truck full of toilet paper, you buy a thing of toilet paper, right? So that moves in little chunks. So we run around the city with our city operation and do lots of pickups during the day. And what we do is we pick up a pallet here, four by four by four kind of skid of stuff, or we pick up a kayak over there, or we pick up these sorts of things, take them back to our facility in Dallas and build them into things that much more resemble that truckload that you're used to seeing, and then reverse that on the other side so we can get it delivered to your house. So that's when I say we aggregate it on one end and we disaggregate it on the other. In order to do that, people don't really understand the scale. So yeah. somewhere like Estes, we pick up about 55,000 shipments a day. A and day. We, a day. And we are m picking up about, so that equates to about 60, 65 million pounds of freight that we're picking up that's every day. That's a perspective. Yeah. And it's a little bit like, you get a brand new jigsaw puzzle every day, but there's no picture or no guide, right? And how do we take all of those pieces, put them together and keep all that freight moving across the country? And the hope is, is we're also delivering about 55,000 <laughs> shipments a day Give and 65 take. million pounds of freight, so it doesn't get overloaded and back up and do all those sorts of things. So it becomes this very interesting cross-country logistical dance. Right. And in order to do that at the scale that we do it at, we've got somewhere in the neighborhood of 220 terminals, 10,000 trucks, 40,000 trailers, right? Lots of 23,000 employees that are making all of that happen. Massive. Um, because of all of that coordination that has to occur just to move those goods. The other thing that's happened in the last three years, right, is the acceleration of that need for data and information. Uh huh, yeah. So not only do we have to do all of that, we kind of have to let you know how we're doing all of sure. it. Sure. Because our customers want to know at any moment along the line when are we going to be there to pick up your freight? Mm -hmm. Who's going to be there to pick up your freight? What's the ETA on that? Where is it in the Estes network? When's it going to be delivered? Who's going to be delivered? Yeah. Did you deliver it? Like all of that information, it used to be okay to get after the fact. Right. Now you need it as it's happening. Real time. And, and that's where you yeah. see a lot, of the, a lot of the heavy lift on the IT side of the house to make that as easy as possible for our drivers and our dock workers. Because trust me, if you go out on one of our docks and ask them like, how many of you signed, and I've done this, how many, how many of you signed up to be a data entry clerk? Um, they just start throwing things at you. It's really not <laughs> what they signed on to do. It's not what they wanted to do. And that would be without lots of investment on the, on the IT side, that's, those are the things we'd be asking them to do, right? Yeah. Like they'd have to write it down. They'd have to communicate to somebody, type it into a system, do all that kind of stuff. So that's where we leverage a lot of the automation and those sorts of things to try to keep all this moving. Yeah. And I know that as a tech vendor, right, who happens to be partner mm -hmm. with, with us, this, uh, you know, there's, there's, it sounds, everything sounds great in theory, right? We all tend to fast forward to the end of the movie and go, and as you're explaining to those folks on the dock, happy path. how it makes you, the happy path, right? How, how it's making your life easier. Mm -hmm. When you, when you're having those conversations, Todd, what are some of the, uh, do you get any pushback around, you know, this tech, this tech, that? Do you, do you got it? Do you have any just, I know it's, it's, it's kind of a, there's a traditional mindset yes. out there in my experience in the industry, right? Mm -hmm. You have, it's polarizing. You have the tech folks that, we're gonna automate Todd and Chris mm -hmm. and Jacob and everybody. Then you got the old school folks that are a little bit more like, hey, this is the way we've always done it, right? Yep. How do you kind of cross that chasm and getting those folks, whether it's on the dock, <laughs> internally at the operations level, at the terminal level, how do you convey the, the value of technology, automation, and again, not going to buzzword bingo here. Right. We all know what I we're can. talking about. You can if you want to. We, no, we got lots of things we I can make time. up. I can make some new ones up. Yeah, how do you articulate that in a way that gets them to sign it, kind of buy into that? Because ultimately yeah. that's, if they're not buying in, even at your level, you don't have that full onboard mentality, right? Well, and I think that's that's why it has taken so long in the industry yeah. a little bit, right? Like, um, you go back, I have gray hair, you go back far enough, like IT told you people- You have hair though, that's yeah, good. Yeah, I, I have some. I'm overcompensating. Um, IT told people how to do things. Yeah, more right? directly. Like, yeah. and that doesn't work, Yeah. right? We spend like, so I've been with the company three years. 
I spent the first six months doing nothing but asking lots of stupid questions. And when I say asking stupid questions, I don't mean like of people in IT, that stuff I knew, right? Sure. Like, what is LTL? Right. Right? Like, the basics. When you talk about closing a trailer, what do you mean? Right? Like, somebody said HOS to me, and I didn't, had no idea what they were talking about. They're talking about hours yeah. of service, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. so drivers are, are, are only allowed to drive so many hours a day. Like, That's right. those sorts of things. I spent six months just trying to understand the business. Yeah. And trying to get rid of this old school divide that exists in lots of places of, IT and the business, mm -hmm. right? So if you start looking at, like so one of the things we did is our purpose for IT at Estes is to make shipping frictionless for our employees and our customers, right? There are As no- a mission statement. There's or, no, yeah. no buzzwords in there. No. There's no, we're gonna be a tech forward company. It sure. is make shipping frictionless, right? right? That's our job. We are, yeah. we are all in the process or all in the business of moving freight and taking that type of an approach when you're trying to bring everybody together, really helps. Yeah. The other thing you have to do is listen, Imagine right? That. Like yeah. most of our best ideas <laughs> come from, I don't know, the people actually doing the work, yeah. right? So we spend a lot of time out in the field, like even today, um, Chris will be nice and won't say it, we were a little late showing up for some <laughs> of this stuff. Part of the reason we were late is because we went to one of our terminals here in Dallas, yeah. and the some of the management and some of the, some of the other folks in the terminal were so excited to talk to us about like the things we've yeah. been telling them we're working on, that we just had to stay and like hear their ideas and talk through what they were thinking about to make sure we don't lose those things as we go forward. And you mentioned all the way over too, you're mm -hmm. about to do somewhat of a road show, right? To get out to those mm -hmm. facilities. Have you seen a huge impact in just showing that FaceTime that you're getting at your level? Yeah. Uh, and, and maybe that inspired you at a younger point in your career, having executives come and actually spend a little time with you, yeah. ask questions, right? <laughs> it's, it's not every day a CI comes in, which hours of service and how does this trailer, is, is it is swing doors or roll up? Yeah, it's. It, I guess there's a sense of pride in them being able to. There explain is their a job. lot, like, yeah. and it's and it's interesting. I, I like. It's funny. Like, people don't interview me; they interview the title, right? Like, so I've gotten. Not to, in this case. I've it's yeah, whatever. <laughs> I've gotten to do a lot of these things because of my title. So I made sure yeah. in a couple of them that like they're going to the terminal, they're taking pictures, they're interviewing yeah. drivers. Like, so I have drivers now that have been in the Wall Street Journal for like IT stuff because yeah. they were going out and talking to them about what we were doing. Guess right? that made their day. Yeah, it, and it got them <laughs> razzed for probably a good 90 days uh, too, but, least, but that's yeah. all good, right? Like, and it's, folks are very open, mm -hmm. and I, I tend to not be a title first guy as much as I joke about it. So oftentimes I'll show up at and be like, I work in IT. Yeah. Like, here's what I'm trying to do. What problems are you having? The other thing I, I, I tell my folks and I do, it, it's really important. Like, if they're having a problem at that moment, fix it. Right, like I've stood on docks and ordered cell phones. I've ordered monitors. I've gone reconnected things, uh -huh. like sweep out a trailer, pick up trash on a dock, like do those sorts of things. Lead by example. Because yeah. we're all trying to move freight, right? Yeah. Like at the end of the day, exactly. if we don't move freight, it doesn't matter what I do, right? Like in sure. that, that business first approach, I, I think becomes very important in any, and can get lost sometimes in the buzzword bingo of digital transformation, fill in whatever transformation, we're all becoming butterflies kind of word you want to use, it, you can lose the focus of the business and it's, and it's important to keep that front and center. Sure. And as we, you know, that's again, one of the challenges we have in selling technology to an industry that some would argue are mm -hmm. a little further behind than maybe other verticals and industries at large. Um, how do you navigate explaining the value of technology? And I know you mentioned we don't want to use Ford you know, uh, I should say buzzwords like forward thinking, mm -hmm. tech embracing, no kidding, right? We, right? I think we all at this point in time know that if you don't have somewhat of a strategy around some level of technology investment, then probably not the best bet. Yeah, I think I used the word future casting yesterday future casting. and then wanted yeah, to slap can, can myself can a little bit. Or, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I get that, but it's, it is about, it's the, well, since having moved to this industry, I, a phrase I used to like to use was point of impact. Yeah. Not like when you're really using trucking. No, right? Like, we're we don't, anywhere, we, right? But we don't want to impact anything. So yeah. I, I've, I've shifted to point of occurrence, right? Point like, of occurrence. Okay. but it's but it's meeting those problems at the point of occurrence, right? Like, and it's for the and it's that business conversation. Mm -hmm. So like we were before the cameras turned on, we were talking about cybersecurity. Yeah, right. Like, cybersecurity is usually positioned in this like scare them first kind of process. The fear factor, right? Yeah. Like, ooh, but like ransomware, like yes, it's a big problem and it's yeah. a big problem for the industry. But also doing those things to help prevent or help make sure any remediation you have to do is simple and fast, et cetera, also help the business. 
Sure. Like it makes the business more efficient. It makes our customers look at us more effectively. They think we're a better partner. They recognize we're protecting their data, mm -hmm. like all of those sorts of things. And it's that conversation that is way more important than me talking about the alphabet soup of tech vendors and possible yeah. attack vectors and like all of that other right. kind of stuff. It is that like, hey, like we have our customers' data. We have a responsibility to protect their data. Here's how we're doing it. Let's go tell them. Yeah. Right? Like those are the types of conversations we're having. Um, or if we talk about optimization, right? Like a space, a space yeah. that you all are in, <laughs> right? Like yeah. folks get all focused in the news or in other spots around, oh, well, that means less jobs. Right. It really doesn't. Yeah. Right, like at the end of the day, what it means is we're actually using our equipment more efficiently. Sure, um, it allows us to be more competitive. It allows us to continue to grow and create more opportunity for our folks. Um, and quite frankly, it reduces lots of rework and lots of other kinds of things. Like there's a little bit of those old adages, right? Like do it right the first time and, and do some right. of those things. As we leverage some of the tech, like whether it's AI, like we'll use all the buzzwords for a second, AI, ML, um, whether it's cognitive or generative AI, like et cetera, okay. like start leveraging those things to make jobs safer and easier, Sure. not eliminate them, right? Exactly. Because there's, you still need somebody to put freight on a truck, right? Like I still need somebody to drive the truck. I still need yeah. somebody to shake hands with the customer and give them a good customer service experience. All of those sorts of things still need to occur. If I can make their job just a little bit safer, a little bit easier, and take out those, those irritants, right? Like where that friction exists in their job, like a, a, a running conversation I've had with lots of, of our drivers, and trust me, they find me, and I have them digitally and face-to-face, -face, <laughs> et cetera, right? Like there are things that I, like I say I know. Mm -hmm. Right, like we have IoT devices on our trailers. We mm -hmm. have telematics devices in our trucks. We have the freights labeled and scanned everywhere it goes, right? Like I know those things, but yet I will ask a driver to type in the cab number that they're in. And I will ask them to type in a trailer number that they picked up. And a, a dolly is the thing. If you see two small trailers connected together, the dolly is the thing in the middle. Right. It's usually my standing joke. You'd be surprised because all those dollies have a serial number. You'd be surprised at how many of them their serial number is 9999999. Imagine that. Right, like, <laughs> but I know what it is because I have an IoT device on it. Right. So we're gluing all of those things together and then trying to use them efficiently using technology to take that friction out of their jobs so they can be safer, more efficient, happier, yeah. get home on time, do all of those sorts of things. Yeah. That's really the goal of what we're trying to do. And what's the feedback been at Estes so far? Is there? Uh, well, the feedback early on was like, uh-huh, a little bit to kind of where you yeah. started, right? Like, well, but we've always done it this way and what happens if and et cetera. But really, at the end of the day, you kind of like, <laughs> I feel bad for my staff because um, you have to back up what you've said. Right. right. So they get stuck backing up all of the saying that I do. Um, and it's been about incremental improvement. Yeah. So when we tell folks Keyword we're incremental, right? Right. When we tell folks we're going to do something, we have to show it to them. Right. And then if they tell us it sucks, we have to swallow that feedback and go make it better. Yeah. Right. And they've now watched us do that. Yes. So, you know, again, back to my story, I'm being late. Like they were so excited to talk to us about all the stuff that we're like that That's we're awesome. rolling out, yeah. and yeah. and now when we put out timelines, and they're like, I, it was funny. Like the terminal manager went, "Ooh, that's a lot of stuff. I'm not sure." And the RVP was standing there, so he's over an entire region of the country. He went, "No, no, no. These guys are aggressive, and I've seen them do it." Yeah. Right. Like so, you have to you have to get in that delivery mindset, and it's really no different than moving freight, right? Mm -hmm. Like like you want to talk about an LTL analogy in the tech space, right? Like. You iterate through code, which means we do very small deployments of new, new little bitty features, as opposed to the old days where we wrote this big monolith and ran it out yeah, at once. The big bang. Yeah. Truckload versus LTL. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. now, you can make an argument at some point. You get down to parcel, which is a whole new world. <laughs> but it it is that leveraging that incremental improvement to make their make their lives better now. Right. They start to like folks start to believe you. Right, sure. like a little bit, and it builds and it snowballs and it builds momentum as you're trying to do a much more broad transformation. Um, and you have to make sure they have a voice. We do lots of focus groups. We do lots of, like you said, I, we just travel around and go talk to people, right? Like yeah. in the absence of a focus group. We've done user-centered design studies with our supervisors to figure out what, what do they believe they need to do their job, like those sorts of things. And then, you know, there's a, there's a happy middle, mm -hmm. right? Like. My, my boss, our, our, our president and chief operations officer, like, <laughs> it's funny. He always wants to make sure I'm paired with somebody from the operations because he knows how crazy I am. 
right? Like he's like, Todd's gonna wanna go right here. Will somebody kind of help him find the middle on the way there? And those partnerships are what really matter, yeah, right? Like I, I traveled here with our VP of uh, continuous improvement and engineering yeah. for operations. Um, I spend a lot of time with our corporate vice president of operations. I spend time out in the field. Like it's those, those relationships and that understanding are paramount to what we're trying to deliver. 100%, yeah. And again, I think even today we had our official press release on mm -hmm. the, the strategic partnership between Optum and Estes. Um, you, know, you mentioned optimization, which I think, right. uh, you know, Optum uh, is- uh, That's where that comes from. That, it it okay. clicked, yeah, right? Got it. Uh, but when Shifty. you think of, it's such a broad stroke, right? And even in my world, I have to kind of, again, there's the optimization. What does that mean? It's, a, it's like AI, mm -hmm. right? What, right. Is, what, what does that really mean? So when you think about this partnership with Optum and the optimization aspect of what we're delivering through our LTL products, and you guys were an early adopter, mm -hmm. obviously see, seeing some results, hopefully. Yeah, I absolutely. I think you'd be here otherwise. Um, what do you, what, how do you kind of internally or externally convey th what that term optimization, how it applies within the Estes network? Oh, not where I thought you were going, but interesting question. But take it anywhere you want, <laughs> No, it's right? fine. Yeah. Just ignore a question and regret. Um, <laughs> I'm not running for office. Um, <laughs> so on the optimization side, right, it really becomes, the thing that becomes the most finite is equipment, mm -hmm. right? Like when you think of it, so even when I say big numbers, right, like we have 40,000 trailers, right? It's a small number, it's, yeah. It's a, it's a lot of equipment and yeah. it's a round number and the actual number is probably, call it plus or minus 10% because sure. I'm the IT guy, what do I know? But being able to get the right equipment in the right place at the right time helps everybody, right? Yeah. Like, so when you start thinking about optimization and now, now you'll get me on a rant. Hey, so go. <laughs> <laughs> I've stolen a concept. <laughs> um, so I had done a bunch of research on industry 4.0 in the manufacturing space, mm -hmm. right? And they talk a lot about digital twins. So if you think about how they design vehicles, cars, airplanes, et cetera, these days, well, it used to be, you build it, yeah. right? And then you build a wooden model, and then you build this other model, then you put it in a wind tunnel. Well, they don't do anything anymore, right? Like they do all that digitally, the wind tunnel's digital, all that kind of stuff. And it helped them be more efficient in kind of how they produce those things and those prototypes. I'm looking at that same concept from a, from a freight perspective and building a digital twin to the freight life cycle, right? So because today, if we have an idea about a different way to load a trailer, we've got lots of trailers and lots of terminals, mm -hmm. we can go try it, that could get expensive, right? And it disrupts the terminal's operation and it does those things. So it becomes much easier and much more efficient for us. And it really is just a complicated math problem. A lot of math. Right, so when we start looking at optimization, there's different parts of the business that you can apply that to, right? Like one of the most expensive things in a, in a less than a truckload environment is your line haul network. Sure. When we say line haul, remember when I said we had about 220 terminals? Um, it is that travel of those shipments between those terminals. That's right, man. Yeah. Right? It's like, so it's not, the, it's not the pickup, it's not the delivery, it's that middle piece, right? Mm -hmm. Well, that gets very complicated for us, and we want to do it as efficiently as possible, which means we want that equipment utilized and using as much of the interior space of that trailer as we can. We want to do it in the shortest amount of miles, so it helps with our sustainability goals, it helps with our, with our cost savings, quite frankly, with less diesel and those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. It means our drivers get home on time and we don't run into hours of service issues, all of those sorts of things. So there's, there's lots of math um, applied to how do we best optimize that, and the problem is, is it changes every day. Right. right. Like Remember the 60 million pounds of freight, 55,000 shipments? Well, just because I know I'm picking up about that many every day, I don't know where they're going. Mm -hmm. And I don't know where they're routing to and all those sorts of things. So it needs to be fast, it needs to be efficient. And where some of those AI models come in, it needs to also have the ability to learn yeah. and say, Oof, I actually could have saved them 300 road miles or I could have saved whatever in this space if we'd have done it this way. So that, and that's just one piece of the business, right? Like with, when we talk about the, the partnership and I, I think in terms of that digital twin, so we're doing that today in our line hall space. We have hall plan and driver plan to help us do that. Um, what we've announced, you know, to keep me honest, what yeah. we've announced at this point, like we're also gonna start using your, your Route Max application, which is the yeah. city That's right. kind of operation. So now I can time, I, I said set that pickup and delivery aside. Well, this is the pickup and delivery. Right. I don't know who's gonna call me today. I don't know how many pallets they're gonna have. Um, some of them are pre-scheduled, so I need to be able to mash all that together and do the same thing I'm doing in the line haul network. 
Um, we're also partnered with you to build kind of the next generation of our dock management yeah. system, right? So now, how do I most efficiently load all of those trailers yeah. for my dock to get them to the right places in that plan, right? right. So by doing all of that, it helps us meet our sustainability go goals. It allows us to offer competitive pricing because we are more efficient as an organization. So reduce carbon footprint, reduce cost, reduce damage because yeah. you're handling freight less often, you're moving it less. That's where most of your damage can occur. Mm -hmm. um, so there's lots of objectives from the business side that this type of technology allows us to solve. On top of that, then over time, we can have crazy ideas. Yeah. Right. So we can extrapolate that data, pull it up to a modeling level and say, what if? Yeah. And I can like, what if we added a terminal over here? Or what if we closed that term? Or what if we just added doors over here or did different Simulate things? things yeah. So you can start simulating yeah. that much like they do yeah. in the industrial world and start playing with variables Yeah. to see how we can continue to improve those things so that we've got the right resources in the right places and we can stay competitive in the marketplace and provide all of the information that our customers are looking for. That's right. And on top of it, like another thing, um, if you're doing all that right and you're able to execute against those plans, it gives our customers a lot more transparency, right? Like, so if this is a two day shipment and it needs to be there in two days, yeah. I can tell you with certainty it's gonna be there in two days and here's how I'm gonna route it, mm -hmm. right? We have some customers on the sustainability side that want us to use rail to for some of the, maybe the Chicago to LA sure. or, or wherever we're using rail in the network, right? Like there's some other customers that are like, our stuff's really sensitive. We don't ever want it to go on the rail, <laughs> yeah. right? Like, and we can start planning for all those contingencies. When we're doing residential deliveries to your house, you, I'm betting you don't have a dock on your house. Right? Working on it. So Working. I can't, I can't just back a trailer up to your front door and start throwing <laughs> stuff through, right? Like, so we need to be able to pre-position equipment. So we have trailers that have lift gates, the metal things on the back that go up and down. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we've actually engineered our own, so we have some of the biggest in the industry. Um, but that allows us to like make sure that equipment is available for that delivery so that when we bring that treadmill or Peloton or large screen, t whatever it is to your house, pallet of bricks, we, can, we have the right equipment there so that we can actually deliver it where you want it, as right. opposed to like showing up and going, where's your dock? Right. So it's that kind of stuff that all of this optimization software allows us to do, which is safer, happier employees, better customer experiences, and it all goes back to the like, how do I take friction out of that shipping life cycle? Yeah, no, what, very thorough answer. Um, yeah. He Expected told me to talk too much, didn't he? No, 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 I said that's, I, I think that's exactly That's what a what very <laughs> thorough answer. <laughs> Shut the hell up. <laughs> I needed water. No, get, get a little sip. Yeah, we're recording. Um, no, that was good. That was good. I think that the more context, the color, the better. Um, Todd, you're a data guy, eh. right? Is that safe? Sure. C CIO? I, think I don't care. You play with data a little bit here and Maybe. there? Maybe. What are your thoughts on, you know, my experience, right? That's one of the, it, it, at the end of the day, it's all a data play, right? Mm -hmm. You can, there's lots of applications, whether it's in this industry or any other. And we talk about the power of data. We talk about the security of data. Right. What about the qualitative aspect of data? Do you, do you, you know, I, sometimes I think that's the, you know, there's the expectation of these vendors to go in and somehow create magic. And, I, and again, I hate to be cliche with the garbage yeah. in, garbage yeah. out, but even as an optimization or any tech vendor, you're almost at the mercy of your trading partners and their level of data, oh, yeah. not just the data, how do we access? How do we integrate? And that's a big part of your job. Yeah, you So how do we, you know, I fundamentally believe until, you know, look at other industries, right? There's, whether it's federal regulation of some level of standardization of government, but in this industry, right, it's kind of the wild west in a lot of ways. How it do is. we, I'd love to get your insight on how do you, how do we, do, I don't know if there's a fix, but how do we get better <laughs> at being with our trading partners and maybe it starts with data quality and access and the pipes to the data? Yeah, there's, yeah. there's lots of things out there in that space, right? Like, so you've got the digital council and the NMFTA and SMC3 and like these yeah. industry acronyms of, That's right. of associations that are trying to tackle it at the, I would say, the highest level of integration, right? Like, right. what are the APIs that, that folks are making available and what are those gold standards for those APIs between logistics providers and shippers, mm -hmm. right? That's only part of it. It's only part of what you're getting at, right? right? Like, so if you start, like I'll stay in the optimization side for a second, when you start thinking about how do I optimize all this stuff, well, I have to have good data about what that stuff is, yes. right? And we work in an imprecise industry. Yes. Right, it's very easy. Like if you own a tire shop, right? Like or or you own a small CNC manufacturer, right? And I want to ship these things. Well, it's three feet by three feet by three feet, and it weighs six hundred pounds. Yeah. 
we pick it up and it's five feet by five feet by five feet and it weighs 1800 pounds. Well, that throws all of the optimization out of whack, right? Like, Absolutely. So part of what we are doing to, to resolve that is A, building much better integration layers to start surfacing that and having the conversations with the business around what's accurate, what's not, right? right. Like, Because we may get that data through EDI, yeah. a thing maybe lots of people haven't heard about in a while, um, but there's lots of EDI in the logistics space. EDI, yeah. APIs, yeah. websites, yeah. cocktail napkins, <laughs> emails, phone calls, like Keep there's going, yeah. lots of ways this data comes in. So at some level you have to standardize that ingestion of like, yeah. here's what this means. You have right. to have a, a, a common language, in IT you'll call it a common data dictionary, right? Mm -hmm. Like of here's what these things mean and here's how we deal with it. Then secondarily you need to be able to move it around the organization and keep that same meaning as it moves. So we've started with, you know, building out a data fabric layer just to be able to move the data around the organization without copying it. Right. Now we're moving towards more near real time streams. So as that data is streamed around, A, more people have access to it, which gets more eyes on it, which gets more systems on it, so that you can start ferreting out that accuracy in the data. Um, and our industry is Secondarily, our industry is messy because there's lots of players. Yeah, right. Like so, back to the, the the guy with the or the gal with the CNC manufacturing shop. Right, they could call us directly. They could call a third party. Mm -hmm. They could call a broker. They could call the consignee, which is the person they're shipping it to. That's right. Yep. All of them could send us a pickup request <laughs> at the same time. Right. So now we're back into this AI conversation. Right. Like, right. how do we learn from those interactions and go? Well, all seven of those are actually the same one. Right. So A, we don't want to send a truck out there seven times, sure. right? Like, and B, we do want to make sure we send one out there once, yeah. right? Like, <laughs> so there's, there's all of that kind of stuff. So you start leveraging AI in those spaces in a real time aspect to be able to almost cleanse that data and start making sense of it at a speed and a scale that a human can't do it anymore, right? right? Like I, I don't care how many clerks or analysts I had, you couldn't sit down and go through, like when I say 55,000 shipments, that might be 120,000 handling units that we're yeah. picking up a day. So it's 120,000 different things we've picked Exponential up. Exponential problem. And yeah. then those break down into pieces, yeah. right? Like some of our customers still ship as pieces and then we have to build the pallets. So there's, there's lots of moving pieces there. So trying to do that without that cleansing mechanism gets very difficult. And then secondarily, being able to move it at the speed of business becomes important as well. So we've sure. been, two years now, we've been investing a lot in those data integration and data cleansing layer so that we we know what we have. Yeah. Now the upside of the the trucking industry is is nobody ever threw anything away. Right? So like I've got lots of data to go it's train yeah. to go train <laughs> things on and on top of it we generate lots of data every day. Yeah. Right? Like at the scale that we deal in cuz like just think about an IoT device that's delivering a ping every 5 minutes yeah. on one truck. Right. Right? That moves 600 miles a day. So you start doing that and then it's 10,000 of those. And then each one has at least one, maybe two, which is actually three IoT devices on the back of it that it's also moving with mm -hmm. that are sending those same. So there's, there's lots of data out there to train things on, but there's also lots of noise to kind of filter through and sort through. So it's yeah. not an easy job. No, I don't envy uh, the task of whoever's responsible for right. somehow getting that data further along and standardized. And that's all just the efficiency yeah. side, right? Yeah. Like you've got safety and regulatory and all of the other stuff that you've got to you've got to deal with as well. Yeah. So lots you, of different pieces. Though. And you guys work with a multitude of different vendors. We're just one. Yeah. Right. Um, so how do you, you know any best practices? I mean, you've engaged with multiple vendors, and, and at Est isn't probably in your prior yeah. life. Maybe a bit of vendor. I have. Any best practices for folks that when you're thinking about the best partnerships, those projects that have come to fruition successfully uh, and those that haven't. Where do, any common themes that you can find that, again, I say a practice that, yeah. could, it, and again, I, you look at these as partnership, right? That's a broad stroke, uh, a term that means different things to different people. But when you think of that true partnership, the collaboration aspect, and just the best ways to deploy technology within an organization that's as massive as Estes, yeah. what, what are your thoughts on, on, again, those best practices? So really a lot of that, so... So I told you before, like purpose is make shipping frictionless for our employees and our customers. We also have a set of principles, yeah. right? And a lot of it boils down to some of those principles. So transparency. Yeah. Everybody has to understand the why and like, not only do you have to understand, you have an obligation to understand, sure. like why are we doing what we're trying to do, right? Responsiveness and resiliency. We all know we're gonna get it wrong. 
right? We don't know how we're going to get it wrong. And hopefully when I get it wrong again tomorrow, it's in a new and creative way. <laughs> right. Like, we have to understand what's going on and we have to build common understanding among, amongst one another, right? We've got to strive to be to continuously get better as yes. we're doing it, so continuous improvement. Um, knowledge sharing, you know things, I know things, um, lots of other folks know things. Like we need to be able to share that in a collaborative environment. We need to keep it as simple as possible. Now, the trick in all of that and why I can rattle all of those off is it spells trucks, right? So I'm not completely stupid <laughs> from a marketing perspective. Like it's about as good as I get from a marketing perspective, but those principles actually really matter, right? Yeah. Like, so there is, no, there is no partnership when you just want to sell me a thing. Sure. Right? Like now it just becomes a game. And it's funny having, I had been a consulting vendor before. So kind of sitting Both on this side, effects, yeah. it becomes a little bit sport some days, sure. right? Where you're like, oh, let's see what I can do with this. But it's not a partnership, right? right? Like I may need the thing. You may want to sell me the thing. It's a transaction and we're done. But if you really want to get to partnership, you have to have a shared understanding of why are we doing this and where are we trying to go? And you have to share in those outcomes. Yeah. If you don't have that kind of shared accountability, transparency, outcome-driven kind of nature, it's it's not a partnership, it's a transaction. Right. And it's fine, we do lots of transactions too, like I have to buy equipment, I have to do yeah. those sorts of things. Um, but truly in those partnership spaces, it's about that shared that shared shared understanding and shared outcome. Yeah, well, when you think of the Optum partnership, mm -hmm. and again, just relevant, right? Yeah. Um, what excites you the most about maybe present day <laughs> and then looking forward? And I know we've touched on a lot yep, of this, but I'm have. just, your personal your personal opinion on what really gets you up and goes, this is a project I really want to be involved with. So we're really getting, starting to get at the core of the business, right? Yeah. So when you when you, you kind of kicked all this off, we were talking a little bit about truckload and LTL mm -hmm. and those sorts of things. Let's be honest. Truckload is a massive industry. Sure. Big it is pie. like yeah. <laughs> 40 times larger than LTL, or I forget the latest statistics, right? It's also very fragmented because Absolutely. it's low barriers to entry and anybody can commit. Well, what keeps happening is somebody comes to me and pitches me, I have this idea for LTL. And then like six months in, they're like, I'm over here working on truckload. Yeah. <laughs> like we, we figured out that's bigger, <laughs> right? And I'm like, oh, good luck with that because it's yeah. fragmented all over the place, right? Like and there's lots of solutions in, the, in that space. But here, you guys are almost, other than like you are experts in the logistics space, don't get me wrong, you're a little bit agnostic when you're looking at like optimization. Right, like, be, yeah. like we, optimizing any kind of a network is kind of similar. Sure. The inputs, the outputs might be a little bit different, but the actual optimization thought process is relatively similar, right? So I get really excited about you guys like focusing on this market and sticking to it and wanting to yeah. go that way and partnering with us in a way that we can stick to it. Um, but even more so, it's the ability to revolutionize some of those things that we're doing in the business at a scale I couldn't achieve by myself, right? right? Like there are, Lots of things that you all are doing that we have talked about internally, right? And I, to be fair, also said it would take me a lot longer and cost a lot more for me to do it. Right. So there's, the products are good. You guys are at a mature spot. Like folks are super excited about RouteMax. Mm -hmm. We had our own system. It's fine. Um, some others might disagree <laughs> with me days, but like. Subjective. Yeah. Sub <laughs> I'll say it's fine. Um, but we're excited about getting that in and, and being able to improve that experience. Um, our Doc software is fine, right? But fine's not good enough. Anymore. Wait for air quotes at some point. Yeah, fine, <laughs> fine's not good enough anymore, right? Yeah, like right. lots of hard people had uh, lots yeah. of people had yeah. lots of good ideas and did a lot of hard work to get us to where we are. We now need much more flexible, nimble systems that can react at the speed we react at today. Sure. And it because it also used to be okay if here's what happened yesterday, here's what I'm gonna do differently today. Now, here's what's happening right now, and here's how I'm going to correct it right now those architectures, those thought processes won't get us there. Right. So by partnering with you all to help us kind of move that ball faster also allows me to free my teams up to build those integration layers, yes. to take some of those like exceptions. So you all are a product company, right? Like, so you're not gonna build everything for Estes. Right. So we've still got lots of things we have to do either to manage exceptions or build glue into our other backend systems. So there's plenty of work, we're gonna to continue to grow, but this helps us accelerate some of the stuff we were trying to do specifically in our operation space. And it, it's funny, like I have the experience today, one of the, one of the TMs said, oh yeah, we, you know, we're implementing route max, like how long is that gonna take <laughs> it? And in unison, Howard and I went, hopefully by the end of the year. Yeah. And they just froze, right? right? And they're like, seriously? And that's when the RVP was like, I've seen these guys probably, probably by the end of the year. And I went, right, and we should have a new iteration of our doc platform by the end of next year. 
Right. That's pretty fast. That's right? pretty fast for yeah. like, particularly when you're dealing with an industry that's used to monolithic applications exactly. written on AS 400s, right? Because you needed lots of processing power. Mm -hmm. um, and that ability to be nimble and loosely couple things together and be able to still get results is a new concept, right? Like, and as we continue to drive through that, we're iterating and we're building confidence and we implemented, you know, to be fair, hall plan and driver plan were not simple integrations for us. Right. Like, I've never heard simple and integration using the same sentence. Right. We had to build for the, anybody. <laughs> we had we had to build the muscle. Yeah. I suspect Route Max will be a simple integration. Yeah. Right? Like because we we're building that muscle, we're building those infrastructures so that we can we can piece things together where we need to. The other aspect of this is by, quite frankly, buying all the products from you. I get to outsource <laughs> some of the integration between those products as well. Yeah. So I'm a little bit excited about not having to do that. Yeah. Because that's yeah. those are massive amounts of data. I don't I don't envy those problems always because when you're starting to model an entire line haul network and bump it up against your model for your entire city network and then bump it up against your model for the dock, when we're we're not talking about small numbers, right? No. Like and that same number is represented in each of those systems. Yeah, y'all can have fun with that. <laughs> um, I trust that you will you will be able to do it and are already doing it in yeah. some instances. Um, but it allows me to focus on like how do I tie that into our freight bill system? Right. How do I make sure that fits in AR? How sure. do I how do I make sure our audit trails work the way that they're supposed to? How do I bolt on some of those things that you're not going to be as focused on because they're very LT LTL niche specific? Yeah. Um, so it gives me lots of ability to move at a speed that the industry is just not used to. Yeah, and you speaking of industry again, you kind of alluded to earlier, mm -hmm. there's vendors you guys have engaged with mm -hmm. that you know, sometime later when you revisit the conversation, like, hey, uh, LTL, we found mm -hmm. it's kind of a limited addressable market, we yeah. moved into truckloads. So one of the reasons I joined Optum within the last few months, right? It's because uh, you're only going to do truckloads? Well, no, I, no, <laughs> I, I, I look at it, right? It's, it's kind yeah. of this, it, the, the story it tells of being able to, with, with Ravi, right, mm -hmm. our, our founder, yep. and being able to kind of go into the airline and the rail, mm -hmm. the mining, LTL, right? Those are arguably more complex in some ways, yes. despite being a, a more dense market with less players. Mm -hmm. So one of the attractions to me was, uh, wow, if you can solve for that, and you alluded to this earlier, Todd, is, you know, yes, it's a different market truckload, yeah. but it is probably on some level the logic that's pre-existing can be tweaked to a certain extent mm -hmm. to probably apply and be way more applicable in truckload as well. So what I would ask you is some advice, right? <laughs> so as, if you're looking at a vendor like Optum that's saying, hey, we, I, I say solved is a very, yeah. I, I don't, it's a definitive term. I think it never solved, right? It's just always incrementally it's like trying to get better. transformation. That's right, right. It goes exactly. on forever. But when you think about our next endeavor in a truckload, mm -hmm. I think that's a reason the strategic partnership, yeah. you see the opportunity. Absolutely. You've, you've, you, Estes has believed in us because we've proven ourselves mm -hmm. in other modes. What advice would you have to myself, other folks on the Optum team as we start to kind of get into the truckload sector? Any, 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 Words of wisdom based on whether it's been at Estes or a prior prior experience in your life. So I'm gonna I'm gonna eat my own words a little bit, um, only because where I was at on the optimization side, right? right? Like optimizations, optimizations, optimization. Like I get I get it. Ravi would argue that with me. <laughs> Ravi has lots of degrees in a space I don't. I'm the dumb guy. Um, I think truckload is just a next step. Yeah. Right. Like just makes sense. There's other complex markets that exist that can benefit from the core of those algorithms. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't, while everyone's excited about the supply chain right now, and as much as I need you to be excited about the supply chain, and I'm glad that you are, um, I wouldn't limit myself to the supply chain. Yeah. Like when you start thinking about anything that's rented, right? Right. Like those markets get very interesting from an optimization perspective. Mm -hmm. um, have had the experience to be near, I wasn't actually on the team working on it, but advised them a little bit. Like around projects where, like, think about healthcare, mm -hmm. right? Like how inefficient the utilization of scarce resources is in that marketplace, and because lots of what you're focused on is in that optimization efficiency space, I think it plays well across. And while the user interfaces might be different, <laughs> like, you're like, why, why is this thing called Route Max? I, don't <laughs> yeah. um, I think the core logic of what you guys are building upon. And I think you're managing it well through like organic growth of the company. Right. You're not you're not attacking every market at once. You're 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 kind of going one at a time. And anybody who's come to me for advice, get really good at this, then get really good at this. Right. When you try to get really good at all of this, 
that's when I watch people start to falter so and wane. Mile wide, inch deep yeah. mentality. Yeah, I've seen it all the time, right? A um, couple more questions. There's there's guys on the. You're, you're, <laughs> you're my ride. So. <laughs> Actually, you sit over there. So, uh, you mentioned going out to the, the terminal today, mm -hmm. and I know you get out there and see uh, mm -hmm. lots of folks. And even prior to Estes, you've worked your way up the ladder. And we talked a little bit about you're more of a, I guess, a non-traditional is the way you put a CIO. I, I, look, I, I get told I'm that all the time. Too. I'm non-traditional a lot of ways too, and I right. think we share a similar path of kind of learning from the mm -hmm. bottom up. And I think that's a, ultimately that's exactly what's gotten us here. I think right. you know, that's my personal opinion. But anybody that's out there right now within your org or elsewhere that's saying, how do I, how do I become a CIO one day? If that's my, my aspiration. And, and you've got a lot of lessons that we certainly could talk for hours over yeah, beers yeah. and so the do's and don'ts. That was your way of saying, keep it brief. No, no, no. I, um, I, I think so I it's a loaded it. question, but it, I'd love it to know like, is, any, a little any, bit. any quick couple lessons that you've learned and advice you would share to people that again, yeah. aspire to get to, they want to be the Todd Florence of their own company. Yeah, there's there's a million paths, right? Like an early, early, early story. I didn't tell you before, so I'll, I'll make up a new one. Um, I was getting my MBA. Yeah. Right, so one of the things when, when people call me non-traditional, my degrees are in finance and economics, right? Like I didn't come out with a computer science degree and here's where I'm gonna well, go. I think finance and econ are not, not a bad place um, to start. And you start, telling, you start telling interns today that are computer science engineers that like, I, my degree's in finance. They're like, how did- Numbers you? are numbers. Right, and then, <laughs> and then you get on a whiteboard and you start architecting something and they're like, I, we're now confused, right? Um, so business first, Yeah. like, Tech is becoming less and less of a mystery as companies mm -hmm. mature and technology matures, right? Like, but business first. Understand the business that you're trying to serve. And that doesn't mean you need to go spend 10 years, like I'm gonna go work in sales for five years and I'm gonna work in finance for five years and all the other kind of stuff. But it is fundamentally understand the outcomes that the business is trying to get to and then start the process of how can I apply technology to help solve that problem, right? And that type of translation puts you in the right conversations, right. right? Like early in my career, I, I met at the time, he was a very young CIO. He was the youngest CIO at Seagram's ever. And I asked him that exact same question. I'm yeah. like, how do I get from here to there? Because I was working at WorldCom at the time, if, for those of us old enough to remember that company. Um, and his first answer was dumb luck, which is yeah, the answer like, every executive <laughs> wants to give everybody. Like, how'd you get there, dumb luck? <laughs> and, I, and I called him on it. Yeah. And he. He kind of looked at me and he went, You really want to know? Well, <laughs> all right. I started at McKinsey. Okay. Right? Like, so that, those. You had me at McKinsey. Yeah. yeah. Those, <laughs> those consultancies are a path, yeah. right? Like, yeah. you get to do management consulting, you get introduced to people in those roles. Yeah. Um, that is a way. Right. Right. But for me, I didn't know what I wanted to do, right? Like, I, I wanted to graduate college at a point in time, a long time ago, with a degree that I could do something. Yeah. Right? It was an actual thing, right? Like finance, accounting, economics. Like it was an act, like there were jobs titled that. I could go do that. And I started working in a startup. And what yeah. they found out was they had me on the sales side doing sales and doing uh, financial analysis of our sales. And they're like, eh, the other guy in ops is better at sales than you are. Why don't you go do ops? And I started looking at ops as a system, right? Yeah. Like what are the problems we're having? What are the questions I need to ask? What are the questions customers are mm -hmm. asking me? And Ended up, we ended up with a partner writing the first ever system to do everything I was doing in operations. Like it was that continued work myself out of a job. And I'm like, oh, this stuff's kind of cool. Yeah. And I started asking questions and started doing that stuff. And then I found out I was a really bad engineer. So be a bad engineer, <laughs> right? Like then move your way into architecture because then they at least don't let you touch anything. Um, but really it was that shift of, I am not the world's greatest engineer. Like my hands on keyboard is ter a terrible idea. Don't ask me to write code. <laughs> but being able to translate what we're, the outcome that we're trying to get to and understand how you can apply technology to that. Yeah. Like, used to be a bigger niche than it is now, but it's imperative now. Like, you you cannot do this job and you cannot do it well. And then the, without that ability to understand where's the business trying to go and how can I apply technology to solve that problem. Now, here's the upside. That become, that's, that's kind of a hard thing to do. Right, like I got to look at these things that are two disparate things and be able to tie them together and build an outcome, and be able to do it in a company that is not a tech company, mm -hmm. right? Like so, as is, we move freight, right? Um, so it's it's a very different thought process than working for a for a startup that writes software, right? Like everybody's an engineer, everybody <laughs> thinks that way. Go not talk, everybody. Go talk. To, <laughs> <laughs> the dumb guys have to. Think Anybody worth anything? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well said. But go talk to the customers, understand yeah. what they want, go solve it, right? 
And in our world, a lot of times, it's the like, well, what if we tried this? Or what if we changed this process? Or what if we do those things? But the upside to all of that is, if you look at current research, there was a long time that this was it. There's nothing else you can do as a CIO, right? Like, you kind of hit the top, then we created all that other laundry list of titles of CTO and all those other things. Right. But there is a person in charge of IT role. Mm -hmm. As you look now as to what's happening for those future folks, like, love my job, love where I'm at, don't want anybody to read anything into this, the future crop of CEOs is coming out of the CIO suite. Right? And that is because no company today can remain, retain or gain a competitive advantage without a deep understanding of how technology impacts their business. Right? Yeah. You just can't do it. Right? I, have, I have B2B customers right now that want the exact same experience on a quarter truckload full of whatever that they get on their Amazon package that goes to their yeah. house. Right? Like, I have business partners that are like, well, my kid can build a website in four hours to do this thing. Why does it take you six weeks, right? Like all of those conversations actually happen. They've all happened throughout my career. If you don't understand how to apply technology to solve business problems, you're in trouble. Yeah. Right. Like, and that is true. I don't care. I've worked in financial services. I've worked in hospitality. I've worked in manufacturing. I've worked in logistics. Like it does not matter. If you can't take a, a technology approach to solving business problems, to give, either give you a new competitive advantage or retain that competitive advantage, you're done, done yeah. right? Like it used to be, if you're not growing, you're shrinking. Mm -hmm. If you can't figure this stuff out, you're in trouble. Grow or die, yeah. 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 Awesome. Last question, and I'll oh, let you awesome. go. Appreciate the time, by the way. Um, I always like to ask for the big, bold predictions, and it could be related to our industry, it could be related to technology, it could be any, anything at all that you see in the next I don't know, 12, 18, My daughters are months. raving. Yeah, it could be. There you go. Could, could be anything. <laughs> so in the context of uh, industry or mm -hmm. tech space, right, and those are broad in their own right, but anything that, uh, any predictions that you see coming into the, oh. we just got out of a pandemic not long ago. <laughs> we right? did. So we don't know what's, the world's an unstable place. It but is very unstable. Any Anything relative, it could be LTL, could be uh, logistics, supply chain, Any anything, the prediction that you see coming to fruition perhaps? It's interesting. Right, there's lots of things bubbling out there right now. Um, it's a little bit of what I was just talking about in that, like, those that can't find a way to leverage technology will not be here, right? Like, I firmly believe in that. I kind of have to, it pays for my bills, but I, I do firmly believe that. I do think, and I don't generally say this about whatever the latest overhyped thing is generative AI paired with cognitive AI is going to turn lots of things on their head, right? Like, we are right, like, it's infancy-ish, yeah. right? It's one of those, it's one of those 20 year old problems that's still in its infancy somehow, um, but it's it's become usable, yeah, right? Like, and it is getting past the like super powered search, right? Because some of, some of the implementations feel like super powered search. But when you can start asking questions in a new way and it is form it <laughs> is formulating answers. Are we going the chat GPT route? I feel like we a can little bit. A little bit, yeah. Yeah, well that's why yeah. so <laughs> generically generative <laughs> AI, right? Like, LLMs, etc. Right. Like yeah, it's yeah. LLMs, yeah. it's all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. I do think that's gonna fundamentally change. It's gonna yeah. make similar to mobile technology, the shrinking of tech, like think of like things like the iPod and the iPhone and the, like it's going to look like those those are going to look like children's archaics toys, right toys, like yeah. the ability to be able to to start to naturally talk to a computer has kind of been this holy grail for the last 25 years yeah. and we're starting to see it get implemented in lots of products yeah. where now my business analysts like and I say my like Estes business mm -hmm. analysts like in the traditionally what people would have called the business can start interrogating data without a middleman Right. Yeah. I, I spoke to a, a small group of students in a master's program that was around business analysis and data science. And they, they're writing little Python scripts and they're doing some of this sure. kind of stuff. They're doing some really cool analysis. Um, and their professor asked me, well, what would you say to them? I'm like, don't underestimate the ability to ask the right question. Yeah. And I'm like, you're teaching them to ask the right question. So don't think that you should just be talking to people in finance. You should be talking to people in IT. Sure. Because that ability to ask the right question is going to drive a, a gigantic leap 
in in where we go as we go forward. Well said. So that's that's my that's my safe prediction. Yeah, no, like I I, that, feel, that feels safe. Like every I think everybody would have said, oh look at what you know well, LLM I mean, and generative AI. It's such is doing a range right of now. emotions, right? Because I yeah. think there's like we've talked about it's the fear, it's the excitement, uh, the efficiency. There, it's all sides oh, of the spectrum, right? Yeah, and there's lots of things to figure out in that space, yeah. like the ethics of it, the regulatory of it, but like. Lots of people worry about those things, but right. it's not going to stop it, right? Too late. So it's, it's Elon, right? Right, it's out. He's out of the bottle, yeah. Right, like so. It's how mu how much can we use it? Where can we use it to make our lives better? How can we how can we improve safety? How can we improve access to information? Um, it will transform entire in industries. But I think it's safe to say, though, for the, the human element, right? The yeah. human capital. Yes. At least in our our field, mm -hmm. I don't, and I always try to reassure folks. You're not getting made redundant overnight. And, oh, and again, me. I always say we've been made as humans, right? We've been made redundant since the beginning of time. Right. We don't know it always. We have to sit and re yeah, introspect and go, oh, yeah, maybe we have. But yeah, I'm not, there's constantly going to be other paths. We're going to get rid of all the lawyers first. <laughs> like lawyers, accountants, the, they'll be the made redundant. Hours, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like that, that stuff will go away. Software developers. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, it's it, you're absolutely right. Like it's going to improve, like again, like where I started all of this, right? Like to make shipping frictionless for our employees and our customers. It'll improve safety, it'll improve efficiency. It, it, we will get to a spot where it doesn't feel so awkward to talk to yeah. a device. Like, Strange to, to think about, but right, yeah, to be right. able to To be able to make those things more efficient so folks can focus on the task at hand and not deal with those small irritants, the right. friction that exists in the system. And we can agree that human to human, uh, I guess yeah. I always say, I, I use a calculator every day, this is my tagline, but yeah. When's the last time you had a good conversation with the chatbot, right? right? So I think, again, to reassure everyone, like, hey, there's definitely applications that humans yes. are far better than machines. Oh, and absolutely. I, I have a hard time envisioning a day where, again, that, that chat, a chatbot is somehow engaging me in a deep discussion. So. Yeah, and having yeah. having been an agilist, right? Like, <laughs> right, right. People overprocess always. Right. Like, and it's those conversations matter. I just I just think there's a lot in that tech that we yeah. haven't even scratched the surface of yet. Agreed. Well, Todd, hey, thanks again yeah. for your time today, buddy. Thanks Appreciate for you coming me. in, and uh, thanks for everybody tuning in. And uh, stay tuned for another episode here at the lovely Market Scale Studio in downtown Dallas, and we'll see you soon.